So this is EE698G. Lecture 7. And we were looking at a D flip flop based phase detector. So the structure we are using consists of a very simple D flip flop where the D input was equal to N1 and the clock signal was equal to N2. And we saw that it's VPD average versus phase error curve. Look like this. So let me call this as some VH and VL. Up to what point is it flat? Till pi. And this is still minus pi. And now we started considering what happens to this curve in the presence of a little jitter in one of the signals. So we assumed that our in one is clean clock waveform without any jitter. And the in two signal was jittery. So the in two signal, all the rising edges are going to shift around its ideal position with some probability. And we said that the probability distribution for that jitter, so let me call that variable as tj, the probability distribution was Gaussian in nature. So this had a mu which was equal to zero because we would expect that on an average, the position is same as the ideal position. Right? And it had some associated sigma value with it. And then we were calculating VPD average with this assumption in place. Can you tell me the expression that we derived? Please look at your notes and tell me what have we derived. So this is VDD into twice of probability of Tj lesser than delta T, where what is delta T now? What have we assumed as delta T? You can look at the notes, discuss and then answer. Delay between and one another. Right? This minus one. And we also did sanity checks to convince ourselves that this result makes sense. Now, this expression can also be written in terms of the error function. Are you familiar with it? Yeah. So this can be written as error function of delta t divided by sigma root. This into VDT. Okay. So the only benefit of writing it in this format is it gets easier to plug into MATLAB. So the moment you have a delta t and sigma and the value of VDD, you can plug this and get the plot. So let me show you how it is going to look like. So I'm again going to plot the VPD average versus phi error. But now since we are working with delta, instead of phi error, I'll mention delta in the x-axis. So this is VPD average versus delta t. You can easily convert between delta t and the phase error. So we would expect the value to be closer to VDD and closer to minus VDD when you are slightly away from the zero point. Right? If there is no jitter, that is if the jitter value is small, which is what we expect it to be, then away as your delta t is larger and larger, we would expect that the average value is going to be closer to the ideal waveform that we got. So we expect the difference to happen closer to the portions where the delta t is also smaller. And it turns out this curve is then going to become linear like this, sort of linear around zero. And the point where it saturates is two sigma and minus two sigma.
So the error function, if you uh, plot the error function, it will have sort of linear behavior around to zero. So this is a very nice example of how you can determine the characteristic of a unit. In this case, we were dealing with a phase detector. Even when you're dealing with uh, very non-ideal behavior, like it was switching from minus VDD to plus VDD. So a non-ideal behavior in the presence of a jitter, which had a probability distribution that was Gaussian in nature, you can still calculate a uh, VPD average versus delta T, and it turns out to be linear around the locking point of zero. Okay. Any questions on this? Then let me give you a question. So given a PFD, So you can do this as a homework. You know that its characteristics are going to look like this. Okay. Now, if I take a deflop based PFT, phase detector, Then the characteristics are like this. Till pi, this is some high value. Then it is some low value. This is still pi minus pi. And then it keeps shifting. Okay. So one thing we like about the top curve is that for all positive phase errors, VPD average is positive. One thing we like about the bottom curve is that if I simply wanted to make a quick decision, whether it is positive phase error or negative phase error, it is directly giving you a logic one or the equivalent of logic zero, right? What if I wanted a characteristic that looked like this? For all positive phase errors, it is a constant. And for all negative phase errors, it is a constant. Right? So the question to you is, can you utilize a PFD and a D-flip-flop D -flip -flop based PD and achieve this characteristic? So you can think about this as a homework. OK, so now we are going to tie in all the points we have discussed so far. Let us see how the delay lock loop is constructed. So far, all that we know is there is a reference signal. This reference signal passes through a VCDL. and you get an out signal. Then we take this out signal, we compare it with the reference. Do you remember what phase detector we are going to use? Yeah. So I'll connect both the inputs to a PFT. So this is giving you two outputs, up and down. This has to be then connected to what is the next component? Charge pump. What comes after this? A capacitor. Let's say this is C. This has a potential VC across this. And we use this VC to go and control the delay of the VCDL.
Right. So if you are using a PFD, a phase frequency detector, it has both up and down at the output. Right. So now you know what a VCDL is. You have seen two types of implementation where you tuned the current, where you tuned the capacitance. You now know what a PFD is. I hope everybody knows what a capacitor is. So then the only thing remaining is a charge pump, right? And we already know that this charge pump is supposed to push or pull charges out of this capacitor. And we know that it has to do this in accordance with up and down. So any suggestions on what I should put here? I can give you one more clue. Let's say when up is high, I want VC to increase. And if down is high, I want VC to decrease. Any suggestions on what I can put here? Why multiplexer? OK. We have to the And then you're shorting up to the output, is it? But we want to control VC, right? If you remember, this VCDL will have characteristics that look like this with respect to VC. VC should be able to take any value here such that the final value it settles to correspond to one clock period. If you are directly shorting up and down, what are the values up is taking? Goes from zero to VDD, right? Similarly, down is also going to go from zero to VDD. So if you directly short it, VC will be either VDD or zero. That's not what we want. But a good starting point. A comparator, and then what will the comparator do? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So if I put an ideal comparator, let's say I put some sort of ideal comparator, right? Which means if up is high, let's say the signs were like this. Up is high, the output goes to logic one, right? So again, we have the same problem. We want VC to be continuously varying. Uh -huh. You need to find some sort of an analog device. Not yeah, a analog device. device, right? The output cannot be a digital, output cannot be digital in it. And again, the clue is we want to be able to push and pull charges out of the capacitor. So let's take an inverter. Tell me what I should connect where. So I'm assuming output goes here. What else? We want, if office, we want VC to increase. Yes. Like, somehow we decrease the, like, he wants is responsible for pushing up that voltage, right? Yeah. That voltage. So, if you want to add an inverter here, I don't mind. Is this the. Not inverter, like, also. The charge on a capacitor, what can I do? Push up current inverter, right? So I simply have to control when that current is connected to the capacitor. It'll it can pull it up to VDD, right? Common source amplifier, and what do I do with up and down? You can connect a common source amplifier with up and down. Okay. You can connect that to the gate of that thing also. And that will like. Once more, common source amplifier? If you connect up to the common source amplifier, the output is going down. You can connect that output to that gate of that thing also. Add to another common source amplifier with gate connected yeah. with the input stage as PMOS, is it? Yeah. Huh. Okay, so I, I think it is a decent solution, but I think we are complicating it a lot. So you'll have to figure out a similar mechanism in the down path and have two amplifiers connecting to the output. Is that what you have in mind? Okay, so let me give a very, very simple solution. What do the 
and then generate a voltage across it. Yeah. Do we need the capacitor in that case? And also, if you are talking about an amplifier and negative feedback uh, with a with some sort of gain, is it? Um, with some sort of gain. So now my up and down are switching every period, right? You're following. Huh? So now let me give you the up and down are visible signal, but we see we want it to be an analog voltage. We, huh, but what is the simplest way? So again, the close, I need to, let's consider only up. I need to push charge into C. And ideally, I would have light because the information of the delta T is now present in the width of up and down, right? But then when up decreases the uh, current, there is no current flow and you are not able to hold that voltage. OTA. Current and OTA. Current and OTA, uh, again, a decent solution. Uh, so you are going to generate a current, which is uh, proportional to up minus down, and then push it to the capacitor, right? So the input to the uh, GM stage, the OTA, is either going to be, so up can take the values VDD and zero. Down can also take the values VDD and zero. So this will be either VDD, up minus down can be zero, or it can be minus VDD, right? So the OTA is going to see only three values. So do we, it, it's not like it's an analog voltage that the OTA is going to detect. So do we need an OTA is the question. So when up increases, I want to push some charges into the capacitor. What if I do this? And this is some constant current I need. Right. When up is high, the switch gets closed and the I0 will flow into the capacitor. VC will increase. Right. Similarly, I have a path on the other side. If down is high, the switch will close and I'll pull the current out of the capacitor and VC will decrease. Is this okay? What happens if both up and down are right? What is the current flowing into the capacitor? Zero, right? And when does both up and down go high? During P reset, right? Anyways, P reset does not have the delta T information. So it looks like this is going to work, right? And a very simple solution. So now to understand this loop better, we are first going to analyze only this portion, the PFD, the charge pump, and the capacitor. Let's say this is in one, this is in two. So you have in one, in two, up, down, we will also look at what is the current flowing through this capacitor IC and VC. So I'll give you a waveform for in one and in two. You can plot the rest. In one. In two. So now you can plot up, down, the current IC and the voltage VC. You can assume that the reset path has a T reset delay. If you are not comfortable directly sketching up and down, you are free to include other signals as well. But finally, I'm interested in what happens to VC.
So the up signal goes high here. The down goes high corresponding to N2. And then after a T reset delay, both of them will come down. Up goes high here again. Down goes high here. And after some time, both of them will come down. How does IC look like? Right. So this is on for this duration. So let me mark delta T. This is delta T. What is this width? This is delta T plus T reset, where this is again T reset. So this width is exactly delta T. And then because uh, when both up and down are on, this current is on, this is also on. So you simply have I0 flowing from VDD to ground direct. So you don't have a current here. This has a value. What is the value here? I know. OK, so now we see, let's assume that it is starting from 0. During this phase, it is going to linearly increase. What is this height? So I naught into delta T is the net charge that has been pushed into the capacitor. That divided by C will give you the step in VC. So after this, it remains constant. It remains constant. And then it increases, remains constant. And I can keep doing this, right? Every period, it is going to increase, remain constant, increase, remain constant. Eventually, where do you think it will hit? So if I assume uh, that I0 is implemented using transistors, it will get limited to VDD. If I0 was really ideal, it will go all the way till infinity, right? So now you have a system where you have given a constant input. So this is a constant non-zero input. And what do you see as output at steady state? Infinite, which means what comment can you tell about the system? It has infinite gain, right? But is it right to say it has infinite gain at all times? Or is there a very specific statement that you can make? Our input to the system is a constant, right? So if you were feeding a system with a constant voltage, right? And you see, so if you have a constant voltage, what do you call this? A DC signal, right? So if a system has infinite gain at DC, right? What comments can you make about that system? One possibility, let's say one possibility is it has infinite gain at all frequencies, right? But if the system, if you knew that the system has infinite gain at DC only, what would be the first block that you think it could be? A low pass filter. Can you be a little bit more specific? Is there a particular function that you can immediately think of? Yeah. What does that correspond to? Integrate, right? So if I tell you, so now again, uh, if this was a constant voltage, I can easily call this as a DC signal. What we are feeding now is a constant phase. Our phase error is not varying with respect to time. Right. Therefore, sometimes we refer to such constant phase also as DC. It simply means that the signal is not varying with respect to time. Any time domain signal, which is not varying with respect to time, it's now a common practice to call it as a DC. Okay. So if I give a DC input, the module is giving me infinite output. So there's a very high chance that what is inside it could be an integrator. Right? So far, OK. Now, looking at this system, do you see integration happening anywhere? The current flowing into the capacitor, right? So when we were initially looking at VPD average, 
we were looking at up minus down average. So where is this up minus down operation happening? I see up minus down. Correct. I see is up minus down. So now I can look at I see average. What would be I see average? You have sketched the waveforms for IC. Can you tell me? I not delta T divided by T naught. Again, I replace delta T by T naught with phi error by 2 pi. So this becomes I naught into phi error by 2 pi. So now we see, let's say at a particular instant, T naught will be equal to 1 by C integral from 0 to T naught, I see average dt. This is 1 by C, integral from 0 to T naught. This is I naught into phi error by 2 pi dt. So I can bring I naught by C and 2 pi outside. This is simply integral of by error into dt, right? So now in this system, what should be the value of phi error such that the VC doesn't tend to infinity? It achieves a finite steady state. What should be the value of phi error? It has to be zero. We are talking about steady state. So steady state is, if I have any value for phi error other than zero, this is always going to either ramp up or ramp down. If phi error is positive, it is going to ramp up. It will never achieve steady state. Or in other words, we say the steady state is infinite. Right? Steady state of phi error should be zero. Steady state of phi error should be zero. So we have assumed phi error is constant in this discussion. Is that okay? If the phi error is being defined by the PSM, Correct. PFD, you get up and down as the output. Using this up and down, you control the charge pump such that the charge pump is giving you some current, IC. The same ICP flows as the current IC through the capacitor. So now if the VC voltage has to be constant, that means the IC average in a period has to be zero. In every period... Correct. In every period, if some finite IC goes into the capacitor, if the average value is non-zero, the capacitor voltage is going to either ramp up or ramp down. Right? So it looks like this particular combination can give you a steady state VC only if it sees an input equal to zero. Is that okay? I naught is a finite value. The phase error is zero. Okay, so your question is if phase error is zero, how do these waveforms look like? Is that the question? Oh, okay. So then IC would be zero, then we have a. Correct. If phase error is zero, this delta T is zero, right? So both up and down will be on during the same time for T reads, which means IC is. Uh, not positive or negative, it is simply zero. Then VC will be steady state. Is that okay? Now, if this is clear, let us put this in the negative feedback loop and see how the whole thing is going to function. That is what we would expect, right? Let's see if that is what is happening. So again, we are simply going to be sketching a lot of these waveforms. So to start with, let me give you the characteristics of the VCDL you are using. Let's say the VCDL had the following characteristic. The magic value to which you want to lock 
which is one clock period, is somewhere here. Let's say this is some voltage VC1. Okay. Let's say I start analyzing, I start analyzing the circuit from VC equal to zero. So the reference signal, this signal is independent of the loop. So I can directly sketch multiple periods of the reference. Now the out signal, this is the output from our system, which means it is incorrect to sketch all the periods together. The edges are going to get affected by the loop. So I'll start with only the first period. Based on the circuit, can you tell me, based on the information you have so far, can you tell me from where I should start the first edge of out? Is it okay to start from here? VC is zero. I should move it towards the right. Somewhere here. Does that make sense to everyone? Is that argument okay for everyone? So what is happening is I mentioned that VC is zero in the beginning. If VC is zero, that means my delay is somewhere here. And this delay is greater than TRF, right? So this edge should appear at the output after a delay more than one TRF. Therefore, I have to draw it beyond this point. That's it. okay. So now you have reference out. You can sketch up, down, the current through the capacitor IC, and finally VC. So sketch this one period after the other because you will need to adjust the out position accordingly. Again, feel free to discuss when you are plotting this. Okay, let us look at this together. So at the first edge of the reference, you will have up going high. At the first edge of the out, you will have down going high. And then both of them will come down after some T reset. So your IC value is equal to plus I naught throughout this duration. Which means your VC has begun to ramp up from zero. So this is going to ramp up. Let me show a smaller ramp. Right? So what does this mean? In this characteristic curve, now your VC is increasing. Right? Because your VC is increasing, your TRF, sorry, your delay of the VCDL TD is now decreasing. So let's say after the first period, you reached this value of VC. Corresponding to that, you now have a slightly smaller value for the delay. So your second period of the out has to now happen slightly early. Okay. So let me sketch that. So the second period has occurred slightly early. Again, the up signal is going high here. The down signal goes high here. And then both of them will come down. So you have I0 getting pushed into the capacitor. Corresponding to that, you will again see a ramp. So this means your VC has increased further. So you are again moving in this direction. So let's say you reached here. Yeah, the increase is smaller than earlier. So if the first increase is so much, maybe the second increase is so much. 
correct. Right? So now your new delay value is somewhere here, but it has again occurred slightly earlier than before. So this edge is now occurring slightly earlier. Again, in the next cycle, you will detect up, then you detect down. Corresponding to that, you'll have some I0 flowing into the capacitor and VC will ramp again. So this will keep happening every period and eventually it will settle down to the magic value of VC1. Right? So every period, your VC is moving closer and closer to this VC1 value and eventually it will come and settle down. Let's assume that our uh, I0 by C was such that, so this ramping was such that it crossed VC1. What do you think will happen then? Right. The moment that happens, if your VC crosses VC1, it means that the delay has become smaller than T rem, which means one of these edges, let's assume that after some time, one of these edges is now going to happen before this rising edge. In which case, your down signal is going to go high first. And then the up will go high. Current is getting pulled out of the capacitor and VC will come down. So this will keep happening till it settles to the steady state. And that steady state will correspond to phase error being equal to zero. Or in other words, that steady state corresponds to this locking to T ref. Right. So if I were looking at the delays, so ideally, we wanted this to lock to this edge that corresponds to the delay of the VCDL becoming one TRF, right? So after every period, if I call this as delta T1, this is delta T2. Let's say this was delta T3. So with every period, your delta Ts were reducing. So your delta T3 is smaller than delta T2, which is smaller than delta T2, right? And eventually the loop will achieve the lock. Okay, so you can take two minutes and ask. Is this a kind of continuous process or like it is happening after every period? It is happening with every period. The VC value is getting updated every period. Like isn't it like initially the current is very high? And then current is safe. Very... Current, current is safe. safe right. Current is safe, charge is higher. Charge getting pushed is higher because the current is on for a longer period. So these current and up down signals are in a kind of digital signal. Up and down, are, yeah, digital signals. So up and down are like digital signals, which is controlling the flow of the constant current into the capacitor. Okay, so uh, take two three minutes, discuss and ask me any questions you have once. So we ideally want this to lock to T R. But of course, in the presence of certain non-idealities, it can lock to other points as well. So we will do a quick uh, evaluation of those. Now, in this discussion, we are going to look at mainly three locking non-idealities. So the first one is called as false locking. It's also called as stuck locking. <laughs> the second one is harmonic locking. And the third point is locking with a static phase offset. So we'll first analyze the false locking scenario. So I'm going to give you an input condition. Let's say the reference signal was like this. My out signal originally had the first period here. 
you can assume that you are working with the current starved inverter based VCDL, which would mean that the delay you are looking at is like this. The characteristics are like this. So can you identify by drawing up, down, IC, VC, et cetera, where this is going to lock? You now understand how to analyze the DLL, right? So I've given you an input scenario. The out signal is slightly delayed after the reference. So if this was the T ref that you wanted, let's say this is the magic voltage VC1, which if supplied to the VCDL is going to give you a delay of T ref. You are clearly now starting from a value which is much smaller than T ref, somewhere here, let's say. So can you identify? Huh, there is some charge on the capacitor, right? So can you identify to which point your delay lock loop is going to lock? What would be the steady state delay between reference and the out? Okay. So let's sketch the waveforms. Again, up will go high at the first reference edge. Down is going to go high here. And then they come down. Right? So let me directly sketch the VC waveform. So VC is now going to increase. It's already starting from some initial value, which is not equal to zero, and it is increasing. Right? And what is the first thing you notice? What is the direction in which you wanted VC to move? Yeah, you wanted VC to decrease. Right? Instead, it is moving in the opposite direction. And where do you think it will go and settle? So because VC has now increased, the next edge is going to happen a little earlier than before. And corresponding to that, again, you'll see that the VC is increasing. The reset periods have become. Again, corresponding to this, the VC is increasing. So eventually, this will go and settle to the maximum value that it can, it can possibly take. So in this particular scenario, I told you that it can go till VDT, which means it is going to settle here now. And that corresponds to some minimum delay for the VCDL. Okay. So what the loop is trying to achieve is to try and bring this edge corresponding to the same edge at the input. You have a VCDL. You feed in an edge. There is an output edge occurring. The loop is trying to make sure that the input edge and the output edge are occurring at the same time which is physically not possible, right? So it simply goes and settles to whatever is the minimum delay it can achieve between the two, right? Now, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Definitely a bad thing, right? Because this T min is not going to be constant across PVT. You are going to have multiple curves associated with different corners. Now, for each corner, you will have a T min associated with it. So this T min is now a function of process, voltage, and temperature. So it is almost as if I have taken the VCDL, I have connected its input to VDD, and I've left it open loop. The loop is not doing anything. All that the loop is doing is making sure that this VC voltage is VDD. So I need not have even used the loop. I could have taken a VCDL, connected the control voltage to VC, and left it as it is to get this result. Okay. So this is definitely a problem. Now, what solutions can you suggest to get over this issue? First solution should be very easy. Start with this. So you initialize your VC 
such that you are starting at an ideal point, which will allow you to lock to TFF, right? So, how how is VC decreasing here? This is the previous case. Which case did you want? This one or this one? Yeah. So like if output is uh, coming before the rising edge of uh, reference. Can that happen? If DA becomes so small then. So your statement was the output edge is coming before the reference edge, mm -hmm. right? But reference delay gives you out. This is the delay chain. You are feeding the reference through the delay chain and you get the out signal. So out cannot occur before the reference. It would violate Sorry? It would violate causality. It would violate causality. Also, these are real systems. The circuit cannot predict and give you the output before you have given the input. So you initialize VC such that locking point is TRF. What would be a good value for VC in this case? Zero. So how would I initialize VC to zero? So I, this is my delay lock loop. How can I initialize the capacitor voltage to zero? Connect an N mass. Connect that gate to VDD. Connect that gate to VDD, but then it is always on. Connect the we can connect VC to the train of N1, source to the ground. So connect an NMOS. Where is the source is grounded? Source is grounded. Drain is connected to VC. Drain is connected to VC, okay. Gate is VDD. Gate is VDD. Which means this NMOS is always on. Like even during the regular operation, it is on. The idea is correct. You need to connect a switch here. Right, but what to do with that switch is the only question. Like, what should control the switch? So, in most circuits, you can have a reset part when you are initializing your circuit. Right, you power on, you reset, and then you start working with it. So, you can have a switch here, and MOS is sufficient in this case, and connect it to a reset signal. So, along with powering on, starting up your circuit, one of the procedures is to reset your chip. That reset thing will make the gate from VDD to zero. Right. So the when the reset is on, it can pull down the VC to zero. And after that, the reset is deasserted. And during the regular operation, you wouldn't put your chip in reset. So it's okay. What would be the other solution? The second solution is actually really interesting. Somehow you have to ignore the, should you ignore the first edge of out or reference? So if I ignore the first edge of out, that would mean that the up is going to go for a longer duration, right? So instead of measuring the delta between these two, I want to measure the delta between these two. Correct. Now, if the first edge of out is happening after this edge, after the second edge of the reference, for example, if this was the out signal, I still want to measure delta between these two. So it is a second edge of reference that is relevant to us. Right. So we somehow have to ignore the first edge of reference. Does that statement make sense? So let's assume that the delay was greater than TRF and I ignored the edge. That would mean that my up is going high here. It is still going. Therefore, VC is still going to increase. Right? 
just that the rate at which it is locking might be a little different. But we are still in the right direction. So does it make sense that we need to ignore the first edge of reference? Now, how do we do that? So clearly, we have to modify the PFD circuit somehow, because that is the module that is detecting the delta. So this is D. Reference is now your in one signal. Your out is the into signal. And then you generate up and down like this. Yeah. Okay, the reference first edge, then down will go high before up. Correct. And we will like draw out current. Correct. Once you draw the so in this particular case, let's assume I ignored the first edge. So then down signal up is going to go high here. Down will go high here. Right? And then they both will come down. And then again down goes high here. And up will go high at the next edge, right? So now if down is going high, that means what happens to VC? It decreases. And that was the direction you wanted to move. We are not assuming zero over here. We are not assuming zero over here, right? Assume the value like VC, right? Ah, so I, I was sketching it for this particular scenario. Now, uh, because you asked that question, let me clarify a scenario where let's say, Reference was like this. Let's assume that we started with VC equal to zero, which means your first edge of out is likely to happen here. Right? After PRF. And again, let's say I ignored this reference edge. Then my up will go high here. Down is going to go high here. And then they both will come down. Right? So in this particular scenario, you wanted your out edge to move closer to this edge, right? Which means you would have wanted your VC to increase. Okay? This was the, and you started some, with some value here and let's assume the TRF was here. So you wanted your VC to increase. So because up has gone high initially, your VC is now going to increase in this duration. So either way, if I ignore the first edge of reference, this is fine. So to ignore the first edge of reference, I clearly have to make some modification in this path. Right? So we simply have to ignore the first edge of reference. Beyond that, the PFD has to operate as it is. So some modification has to be made in this path. You can think about what that modification should be as a homework. Okay.